Hi there, my name is Wilton and I'm a product manager here at Fintel. Today I'm going to walk you through one of the more popular pages on Fintel, which is the ownership pages, and try to describe some of the information here so that you might be able to use it a little bit better with more and have a better understanding of what kind of data is offered to you. Um, <clears throat> to get to this page, uh, you can go to any page on Fintel and then use the search function here to type in a ticker and click search and go down to the security that shows up here tesla motors click on that and then go to ownership here and click on current ownership and you'll be back to where we started now at the top of this page here you see this kind of large table here that has some descriptive information as you can see there's the security there's the, the ceo this is this is actually updated from the insider filings uh, the industry, uh, the number of institutional owners that we have counted, the number of institutional shares that we've counted, the percentage of total shares uh, owned by institutions, uh, the total common shares outstanding. This comes from the company's 10Q and 10K filings. So based on the date of this, I would um, assume that this came probably from the 10K. And then the total institutional value currently at $155 billion dollars. Um, I'm sorry, yeah, 100, $155 million. Um, so let's keep going. Uh, and then, of course, there's some related uh, uh, information here on bonds and so forth. These are QCIPs for the bonds. So um, here we have some kind of general descriptive information. Over here to the right is a historical chart of the ownership uh, by shares. Uh, we think this is this is helpful because it's, it's good to kind of get a sense of what the ownership is trending on and um, if you're not familiar with the filings that that fintel uses um, it uses 13 f's and imports and 13 d's and 13 g's this is all this all comes from 13 f filings here um, 13 f filings are filed on a quarterly basis and so you'll see that these numbers you know basically uh, change each quarter and you can see that there's a little bit of information coming in for the fourth quarter but it's not all not all here yet so, institutional put call ratios. Um, we, we we put a lot of thought into into this, and if, if you go back and look at institutional holdings, um, and you think about the fact that your people kind of use total institutional ownership as an as, as a proxy for institutional sentiment, uh, it's actually really interesting because the idea is that you know we're looking at the holdings of of institutions. These institutions. Uh, typically have large research budgets and they typically you would imagine that they can do a lot of due diligence and so therefore if they're increasing their if, if, if every institution or if you see total institutional ownership increasing then that would is indicate perhaps a bullish sentiment um, but one of the things you have to understand is that there's a lot of institutions that are passive investors such as index funds they don't make any decisions about what they're going to invest in they simply mirror indexes and so what happens is is, is you you get some pollution of the information in total ownership. If you consider the fact that Vanguard is, is the largest uh, investor in the world with at least a trillion dollars in management, a large significant portion of that is passive index funds, then <clears throat> you know simply looking at total ownership is not necessarily a good signal. But one of the things that's interesting is that uh, inst index funds don't buy options. Uh, what you'll find is that hedge funds buy options and, and, and smart money, I'm, gonna, I'm using air quotes here, smart money buys options to hedge their bets. And it turns out that options are actually required to be reported on 13F filings. And so what you see here is a chart <clears throat> of the institutional put call ratio for Tesla Motors. You can see here that the total ownership uh, is climbing but if you look at the actual uh, uh, calls versus puts, obviously puts are bad and calls are good, it would actually indicate that the institutional sentiment of the, quote, smart money might be negative, okay? And we believe this to be a superior indicator of institutional sentiment over simply looking at the total in institutional investment. Okay, so now we're getting down here to the actual tables. Uh, you can see we have Two tables here, 13D, 13GF, 13F, and import filings. Uh, we have different tables here because the information 
that is supplied by these filings is, is quite different. And the reason is because the, the, um, the goals of these filings are quite different. Uh, the SEC requires anybody who owns 5% of a public trade company in the United States to file uh, a beneficial ownership uh, form. And this is basically designed to track who has voting power over in, in a company, right? So uh, they want to understand, they want to track who, who, who basically uh, is controlling these companies. And so 5% seems to be a threshold for them. Uh, if, 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 they, if the company is a passive investor in a company, then they can file a 13G filing, which is less, um, I guess, less onerous for them. If the company intends to influence management, i.e. they are an activist investor, then they must file a 13D filing. 13G filings typically are required on an annual basis. You'll see most of these are, were all filed back in February of 2014. That's when they're due on an annual basis, to, uh, February 2000, I'm sorry, February 14th. 13D filings are required within, I think, five to 10 days of reaching a 5% threshold and within five to 10 days of any significant material change after that. So you might find companies that have a ownership percentage of less than 2%, that would indicate that, I'm sorry, less than 5%, that would indicate that they were at 5% at one point in time, and perhaps they've, they've, they've decreased their ownership percentage. So this tells you shares and ownership percentage, that's what they're required to report. We actually calculate uh, the change in shares and the change in percent ownership uh, from filing to filing, we do that for you. Um, and you can see here there's no activist investors here. It's not clear to me why Elon Musk is not filing a 13D. It seems very strange to me, considering his ownership of Tesla. So um, let's move on further down here to the 13F import filings. Now, let me talk about 13F filings first. 13F filings are what most people understand when they talk about institutional holdings. I think probably most, if not all, institutional ownership data that is available to in investors comes from 13F filings. Um, and again, th the goals of 13F filings is, is, is significantly different than 13Ds and 13Gs. Any institution that has more than $100 million on an active in, in management, under management, is required to file a quarterly report of their holdings as of the end of each quarter. So that means that uh, you know, every quarter, these institutions have to have to put together a, uh, a document and send it to the SEC and list all their positions, and they have to list the shares, and they have to list the value divided by 1,000, right? So we, we can calculate a lot of stuff from this. Now, this is different than 13Ds and 13Gs. You don't have to be a company with $100 million under management to be required to file a 13G. You just have to have 5% of a company. You could only have a million dollars, but if you had 5% of a public trade company, you still have to file a 13D or 13G. Likewise, you don't have to have 5% of a company to be required to file a 13F. Okay. The other filing that we track now is import. Imports are, are relatively new filing. Uh, they're required of mutual funds and ETFs and so forth. Um, you can see them abbreviated here, NP. Uh, there's a lot of companies that are required to file imports that are not required to file 13F. So we think there's a lot of information here and we're, we've, we've started digging into them to try to, to tease them out. Now, one of the things you have to understand is that there are large institutions such as Fidelity that also have uh, mutual funds. And so what you'll find is that Fidelity is probably in here somewhere and you're also going to find each of Fidelity's mutual funds in here. And so we're we're working on making sure that we don't double count those. We don't actually count imports in institutional shares and institutional value yet. We don't actually calculate imports in here because we don't want to double count. But at some point, we're going to figure out and, and work on a way to make sure that we can we can actually show that information uh, in, a, in, a, in a reasonable manner without causing errors in, in, um, in the calculations. But we're listing them here so that you can see uh, on, on a line-by-line -line basis, what people are doing, okay, what these institutions are doing. So, let me walk you through uh, one of these inst one of these lines here. Let's take a look at um, 
Commerce Bank here because this one looks kind of interesting here. So what you see here, first of all, on the left is the file date. So we, we uh, on, on January 17th, Commerce Bank filed their 13F and they told us how many shares they have and what the value was. Okay, that's all they told us. And the rest of this information we, we kind of calculate from what we already know about them. The average share price, if you were to take the total value and divide it by the total number of shares, you would not get this information. You would get the, the average share price as of the last day of the last quarter, which would have been December 31st, 2019. This is mid-January that I'm recording this right now. That's interesting, but not that interesting. What would be interesting would be to know what was the average share price over the quarter. And so to calculate that information, we take this, the total value, divided by the shares at the end of the quarter, the total value divided by the shares at the beginning of the quarter, which isn't displayed here, and we divide it to calculate the average share price over the quarter. Okay, so that gives us a sense of what, um, what happened during that quarter. Now, because we have the prior filing on file, we can actually calculate how many shares, what the percentage and change of what's the shares. What's, with it, that's this number here. We also have the prior value on file so we can see that the, 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 uh, uh, the value changed. So you can actually see that they sold some of their shares and yet the value went up. I guess that's a good thing, right? Um, um, and we can also say what the cost basis is. Now the cost basis is kind of our definition is what was the cost of the change in actual shares? So we don't actually have the total number of shares that changed. We know that we, they, they decreased their shares by 34%. So let's just say it was X shares. Um, if you take those X shares and you multiply them by the average share price, you'll get the cost basis of $87,000. So the point of that is, is that $87,000, $87,800, I'm sorry, 87 million was the total cost of the shares that they sold uh, that quarter. Now, if you take that number and you know what the value is, you can actually calculate the profit for the quarter as well. And then if you uh, take the profit for the quarter and you know what the value was at the start of the quarter, which is not this number, you can actually calculate the, the, the annualized return for, for, this, um, for this, this company. So that's kind of a deep dive into what these lines all mean here. I'm going to do a, uh, another dive here. I'm going to click on this detail. I don't know if you guys are, have seen this before, but if you click on this, you can actually get a page that shows the history of this investor in Tesla. So this shows you a chart of Commerce Bank's uh, um, kind of positions in, in uh, Tesla over the years. We can actually see uh, uh, the effective date here. So on the prior page, we showed the filing date. This actually shows you the effective date. So we know it was as of the, uh, the, the 1231 2019 uh, QSIPs. Uh, we try to track when QSIPs change and maintain the, the ownership from quarter to quarter. The average share price on you know for this quarter was here. This is the shares. This is the change. So this this all this information was available on the prior page, except for the allocation. Now the allocation is important because if you think about an investor like you know Commerce Bank, they have a certain amount of money. Uh, uh, their, this allocation shows you the percentage of their total reported assets that were invested in the Tesla. So you can see that, and, th and this is an important indicator, I think, because if you look, you know, look simply looking at, you know, raw numbers is one thing, but looking at the total um, allocation for their portfolio, I think, is, is actually more probably the most informative. Bit of information you can you can find. You can see that back here it was 0.21. Now it's 2.23 percent. So they've actually done a pretty significant increase in in allocation uh, over the years. Okay, uh, and I think that's it. Uh, you can see the put call ratio for these guys as well. They actually have a lot of. Um, they actually increase their options significantly on this uh, as well. So. It's kind of interesting. Um, all right, so let me go back to the main page here and see if there's anything else I wanted to show you. I think that's it. Hopefully this was informative. 
If you have any questions, please make sure to put them in the comments.